you know the thing where everyone on the software engineering team turns up every day and writes code for eight hours and then goes home? And then later, the project is wildly successful. <laughs> no, you don't. Nobody knows that thing. Um, as Rod just told us, it's a lot more complicated than that. Um, Oh, as is finding a clicker. Ah, so yeah, coding is, coding is important. I don't think that's a very controversial opinion. But there is a ton of other skills that we need to bring to work every day if we want our projects to succeed. Like, uh, ooh, clicker? Clicker? Mm -mm. Ah, oh, it's moving. OK. Like noticing when people are blocked, uh, noticing when someone on the team is having problems and helping them get unblocked or um, reviewing design documents and noticing the thing that's being hand-waved, the blur words, um, or what's not going to work, or onboarding new people and making them productive more quickly, or making sure that the team's roadmap is up to date and not you know, a pile of lies. Um, I call all of this glue work. It's, like, it's technical leadership. So we do get some signal for it on uh, you know, the kind of leadership interviews we might do for senior engineers. But sometimes a team ends up with someone who's not senior, like a junior person who just happens to be good at noticing this stuff. Like someone, I call them people who are senior before they're senior. Um, they, they start doing this work, and it's useful work. It's the kind of work that makes the whole team better, and there's plenty of it to go around. But people aren't always rewarded for doing it. In fact, doing career work too early can be career limiting, and it can push people out of the industry. It's kind of ironic that we lose good engineers because they happen to also be good at a skill we want. <laughs> Hello, my name is Tanya. Um, I'm a principal software engineer at Squarespace. Uh, we're based here in lovely New York in the West Village. This is our roof deck. It's um, pretty, I think we're pretty cool. Um, and where is Tanya on Twitter and GitHub? And yeah, I vlog at noidea.dog, which is obviously a Squarespace site. Um, and today I want to talk about glue. So here's the agenda. Um, I'm going to tell a story of someone whose career is hurt by glue work. It is not exactly a true story or not a true story of one person. Like it was originally a mashup of about 10 true stories I had seen. But since I've given this talk a few times and the slides have been on the internet, I've had so many people who emailed me and DM'd me to say, this was my story. Um, then we're going to talk about fairness both in the outcome of the story and in how work is distributed. Um, then we're going to talk about whether or when to leave the IC engineer track and uh, like become a people manager or product manager or project manager. I imagine a lot of people in this room have grappled with this decision, and I bet everyone has an opinion on how to make the decision, and I will give you one more opinion. Um, and we're going to talk about how to frame your work if you're doing a lot of glue and how to make your impact visible and how to help your coworkers or your reports do the same thing. And then finally, I want to talk about learning and growing, which is something I don't think we talk about a whole ton. We don't really admit that we learn things. It's just like the knowledge appears. Um, OK, story time. Imagine a software engineer. Here she is, first day in a new job. Out of college a few years. She's had her first couple of tech jobs. She is not wildly confident in her skills, but she's doing OK. She likes the work. But her new code base is very hairy, and her first changes take a long time. This is really normal. But everyone's busy with their own thing, and no one's really reassuring her. Um, she's feeling like she's working too slowly. She's asking too many questions. She needs too much help. And after a few weeks, she's really scared that they regret hiring her, and everyone is too polite to say. But then she gets her first win. An internal customer comes in with a request. They need this set of data. And really, the team's API should have this data, but they just haven't prioritized the feature yet. So our friend here spends a couple of days manually getting this data for the customer. The customer's overjoyed. Um, it's a like really good feeling for the engineer. It's the first time like, she's done something that other people are obviously happy about. She documents the process so that the customers can do it themselves from now on. Um, and she documents a bunch of other things that people keep getting asked on Slack. So, the team is getting fewer interrupts. They're getting more done. The customers are happy. Everyone's happy. OK, back to the difficult code. A while later, she gets talking with people on a, you know, a nearby team who seem to have a different idea of what problem they're all solving. So she sets up a meeting with the system designer and her team and the lead on the other team and gets them talking to each other and uh, invites herself to the meeting and asks a whole lot of questions and writes down the answers. 
and sends an email around afterwards saying, hey, I think this is what we all decided. Um, now everyone's got a shared understanding of what got agreed, and they're all going in the same direction again. New people join the team. Now, she remembers her really terrible first few weeks and sets them both up with mentors and writes a bunch of onboarding documentation. The mentorship thing seems to work, so she sets up a whole mentorship program so everybody new who comes along will get a mentor from now on. Now, this company keeps having outages, and uh, they're often attributed to lack of tests in the code base. So she gathers a bunch of people who are more senior than she is and keeps pushing until they all agree on coding standards for the organization. So all code will be more tested, uh, more readable, more reliable from now on. There are fewer rollbacks, and code review gets faster because there's a consistent style. Now, the manager has a bunch of teams and is starting to rely on the engineer here to know what's going on in this one. The manager's like, hey, awesome coder seems blocked. Do you know what the deal is with that? So our engineer investigates, and she discovers that Awesome Coder is deep in a three-week-long email chain where uh, people are replying to each other with almost useful information over and over again. And she wades into the middle of that and talks to people in real life. Um, she gets the information that Awesome Coder needs and blocks the whole thing. Um, the coder says, thank you. He writes thousands of lines of code. And uh, since our friend here has a lot of state on the project, she writes his documentation on the lunch plan and the thing ships on time. Well done, awesome coder, everyone says. Two years pass like this. Our engineer keeps vowing that she will write more code soon. But every day, something more important comes up. <laughs> the team has started to treat her as an unofficial lead, because she's got a broad view of everything that's going on. She has one-on-ones with basically everybody. And she can spot the things that aren't happening in the negative space between the designs. Um, she's mentoring basically all the new people. When she does have free time, it's you know, an hour or two between meetings, the idea of swapping this incredibly difficult code base into her head for two hours and then dropping it again to go to a meeting is incredibly painful. She doesn't do it. But she's not worried, because everyone keeps telling her how great and necessary her work is. She's getting glowing performance reviews. And in fact, she feels like she's gone up a level. Now let's see if the company promotion process agrees. Who do we promote? Well, obviously, we promote the person who wrote all that code. Well done, Nelson Coder, you're senior now. And we promote the system designer who did the design for the thing that integrated so well with the stuff they were building in the other team. So, well done, system designer. And that's it. And she's like, wait, what? I mean, why not me? And they were like, well, your project's not finished. You're not producing a lot of code. We looked at your PRs. You haven't written very many. You didn't have enough impact yet. She said, well, I decreased onboarding time, and I made us build the thing that integrated with the other team instead of whatever we were building. Um, our customers say I'm still the only person who helps them. I did that thing with the coding standards and the testing guidelines. Were you there for that? And uh, I review all of our design docs, and I ask questions and leave comments that make them better. And they're like, yeah, that was all good. But like, what was your technical contribution? She's like, I don't know. Wasn't that technical? I mean. It wasn't code, but not all technical things are code. They're like, look, you're great at communication. Your soft skills are outstanding. We just don't think you're an engineer. Maybe could you be a project manager instead? So I mean, was this fair? She did important work. At every point, she did the highest impact work that was available. And the project wouldn't have shipped without her. She was the glue that held the whole thing together. Over the last two years, she got really good at technical leadership, like understanding the problem domain, understanding the people, introducing standards, making the designs better. But she legitimately didn't get better at coding. What do we do with this? So we have a room here full of hashtag leadership. Uh, <laughs> is this a senior engineer? Who's, who thinks yes? Uh, for the video, this is like, I guess, a, a fifth of the room, maybe? Who thinks no? Who's a, who's a hard no? Uh, nobody's willing to admit they're a hard no. That's really funny. <laughs> it's OK. I, who is extremely conflicted by this? I, I am. I think this is difficult. Um, one thing I'm certain is that her manager bears some responsibility here, because there was a communications breakdown. It shouldn't have been a surprise. She was getting glowing performance reviews. She believed she was on the path to senior engineer, and she did a ton of work that was representative of senior or staff engineer work. It's the sort of thing we expected people to do to show leadership. But this company doesn't consider that to be significant promotable work. 
are not sufficient significant promotable work at this level. Although they haven't explicitly said so, they want code or other quantifiable technical work at the level she's in. And her manager never told her she was doing too much non-promotable work. Like probably the manager was just glad that the glue work was getting done because someone needed to do it. Glue work is often the difference between um, a project that succeeds and a project that fails. This is why uh, technical program managers, TPMs, and uh, project managers make such an impact. They, they do the ultimate glue role. They see the gaps and they fill them. But in teams without project management, what happens? Well, in some teams, the manager picks up the stuff. And in others, the work gets spread among the people who are willing to do it, or the people who are expected to do it. So I read this article about volunteering on hbr.org, and there's an accompanying 35-page study, if you prefer 35-page studies. Um, and it showed that when there's non-promotable work to be done, women volunteer to do it 48% more often than men. But they also found out that men volunteer less because they know if they wait, the women will volunteer. In all male groups, they had no trouble getting volunteers. I want to say that again, because I think this is so important and it blows my mind. If there were no women in the room, men volunteered. If there weren't, they didn't. Like, dudes, what the heck? Um, <laughs> the even more interesting part was when managers were asked to choose someone to do thankless or non-promotable work, they asked women 44% more often than they asked men. I want to be clear that I'm not saying 100% of your work should be promotable. Like, I think it's good to build auxiliary skills and expand your horizons, and it's also important for everyone to do their fair share of taking out the garbage. But a large percentage of your work should be the thing you're evaluated on. If you're doing very little of your core job, you're hurting your career. If you're a manager and someone on your team is doing very little of their core job, unless you're really being careful about how they're evaluated, you're letting them hurt their career. And non-promotable work is one of those, like, one person's trash is another person's treasure things. You know, like, um, if an engineer organizes an offsite, uh, that's like 100% non-promotable work. That is uh, in no way use, career useful to an engineer. If a manager does it, it's team building. It's, like, it's good at making the team better. If an event coordinator does it, then uh, it may be their core job. Sometimes there is work that is genuinely non-promotable for anyone, and in that case, it needs to be shared. Like the, the manager or, or whoever tracks the work on the team needs to track this as real work and share it out deliberately. If it just gets done by whoever picks it up, it won't fall fairly. I invite you to take a moment and think about who is doing the non-promotable work in your vicinity. Uh, OK, back to our friend, our engineer friend. Uh, folks are now suggesting that she should change to a role where the work she's doing would be promotable. And I've seen this a ton of times, this message that um, you're doing work that's not promotable in this role, so change your role. Instead of, we, say, we don't say, um, so change your work, or so change the story we're telling about your work. So let's talk about changing roles. I read a ton of articles on deciding whether to do a role or not, and most of them are people uh, writing the article who are already doing this job, and they want to see if you're cut out to do the job. So like they say, um, can you handle giving feedback? Do you like coaching? Do you like people? Then you should be a manager. Or um, can you put yourself into the shoes of your customers? You can? Excellent. Then you're a product manager. It is decided. <laughs> but it's like those signs at carnivals. It's like, you must be this tall to go on the roller coaster. And I'm like, I'm, I'm tall enough, but that looks horrible. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone is screaming. People are vomiting. <laughs> so that when they say, you must be this socially competent to be a manager, it's like, well, for actually kind of similar reasons, uh, that is not my idea of a good time. <laughs> I have my own metric for it. If you code, you get better at coding. If you manage people, you get better at managing people. So what do you want to get better at? What are the skills you want? Like, it's not what skills you already have. So like, what skills do you wish you had? Because the vast majority of our learning happens on the job. But I keep seeing people not considering the roles that they would like to have because they don't have all of the skills of that job. Like I've seen a lot of CS college students telling me they're not applying for, uh, for programming jobs because they don't feel like they're especially strong programmers. It's like, of course you're not an especially strong programmer. You're in college. When would you have become an especially strong programmer? The vast majority of our learning happens on the job. So they end up choosing a role that they don't want, or a role that they think would be fine, 
because other people are telling them they would be good at it or because they're scared of doing the role that they do want. So I always advise people to choose deliberately. Choose a role that you will feel successful and happy and proud to say that you do and that will teach you skills you want to have. Do a job you're excited by. You'll learn to get good at it by doing it. I feel like we don't admit often enough that most of the time when we start a job on day one, we're only kind of maybe okay at it at best. The vast majority of our learning happens on the job. We get good at it by doing it. There is another consideration, though, um, especially when people make this decision in college or when they're junior, which is that taking a step away from a more technical role closes doors. It's not fair, but our industry biases are set up so that you really need a solid engineering resume before you take a non-engineering role. Because the moment you give up an engineer title, if the moment the most recent job on LinkedIn doesn't have the word engineer in there somewhere, half the industry will assume your tech skills just disappeared, they're gone forever, and you are now incapable of acquiring more. I don't know how that's supposed to work, but it's an incredibly common implicit bias, and especially if your job title is any variant on project manager. Many people will immediately assume that you're not good at technology. Uh, Kripa Krishnan, who's the legendary director of cloud product operations at Google, she once said that she had experienced some industry prejudice for being female and some for having an accent, but it was nothing compared to the prejudice she experienced for being a technical project manager, a program manager. Um, project managers and TPMs are just routinely underestimated by engineers. Don't, don't do that. I've seen a lot of people take a role like this um, and find themselves pushed towards being a non-technical program manager, or project manager, or a non-technical people manager, which is a step towards leaving the industry. And I've seen some look back at engineering jobs, even when they've done them quite recently, and discover that they can't get hired at the level of developer that they used to be, again, even if it was quite recent, as if the skills are just gone. And so they come back in at a lower level than they left because people don't really believe they're capable of the job. They inevitably hear the three most infuriating words on the, in the industry, which are not technical enough. Like, what is this? What is technical here? It's so domain-specific. How do you do anything actionable with this? If you're ever tempted to tell someone that they're not technical enough, first of all, don't. But uh, <laughs> second, just be really specific about what you need them to know. Like, um, we need you to understand and participate in the technical discussions and design meetings, so please get comfortable with the trade-offs in this set of technology that we use. Uh, maybe here are some books I recommend. Like, or um, all of our senior engineers are systems designers, so please take some distributed systems classes and have opinions about the CAP theorem. Like, Otherwise, you're basically only saying, you just don't seem like an engineer. Could you be a bit more, I don't know, engineering-y? It's gatekeeping. It's not actionable feedback. Which brings us back to our friend. Two years ago, she joined as a mid-level engineer. And since then, she spent her time filling the gaps to make the team and the organization succeed. And as a result, she's just been told that she doesn't have technical accomplishments. And she would like a promotion. Let's talk about that for a second, because I'm putting a lot of emphasis on career advancement, and that's not always a priority for everyone. Um, but here's my explicit bias here. I want this engineer lady to feel fulfilled and have long-term financial security. She would like to someday retire and buy a little boat. And I want us to help with that. Um, but I don't know what her right career choice is. Only she can make that decision. So she should choose deliberately based on what would she like to get better at, what is a job that will make her feel happy and proud to say that she does? And what doors is she comfortable making hard to reopen? But unfortunately, there is one more, which is where will she feel safe? If she chooses a role she's less excited about, but where she's going to feel more supported and less alone, I'm not going to judge for that. But I hope she gets to do something she loves. Either way, I will respect her decision. But for the rest of this talk, since I can't do choose your own adventure in slides, um, we're going to assume that she decides to stay as an engineer. Um, so uh, she wants to be a senior engineer, and really, she's already doing most of that job. But she's getting a whole lot of not technical enough. What do we do with that? What do you do if you're glue? Or what do you do if you're managing someone who's glue, and you don't want to waste their skill set? Here's a four-step plan. First off, there needs to be a long overdue career conversation between this engineer and her manager. She needs to ask direct questions like, Will I get promoted next round? What work do I need to do to get promoted? Is this promotable work? Questions that need very unambiguous answers, which she should then write down. Her manager needs to be honest and direct about this too, based on their understanding of the career ladder. 
It can't be like, oh, you're doing fine, unless she really is, according to the career ladder. Communication needs to happen, that's what I'm saying. Second, a job title. If she and her manager want to continue doing a whole lot of glue work, can you find a title that gives her tech credibility? Like, can she become the technical lead of something? People expect a lead to do a ton of glue. Um, Marco told us this morning about how important career ladders are for engagement and retention, and I think formal lead roles uh, have sort of similar effects, with explicit responsibility. Um, so there are probably some people uh, statistically in this room who are thinking titles don't matter and it's stupid. And maybe you, person who is thinking that, wherever you are, maybe you don't need them, but it doesn't mean other people don't. Look, if you're a white or an Asian dude, people assume you can code. Like, you might have graduated yesterday in law, and people assume you can code. <laughs> For the rest of us, we just don't get that free assumption. A job title gives us time and energy that we don't have to spend putting our credentials on the table, spending the first 10 minutes of every meeting proving that we deserve to be there. It just gives us some hours back in our week. Go with it. Um, and it gives us some freedom to do glue work without people saying that we're not technical enough. Third, she needs artifacts of her work that show her impact and tell a story. And the story needs to be this. Due to her work, due to her technical judgment, this thing happened. She's not the helper. She led this thing. She made it happen. Her manager should be telling the same story. If you see the situation where a glue person is the only reason something happened, publicly give them credit. And again, not for helping, but for making it happen. She should be creating and saving artifacts that back up this story. Like uh, anytime she writes things down, the meeting notes, group emails, all the crucial points where she made the thing happen. She should write small design proposals where possible. Now this still might, might, might not work. Uh, maybe six months later, the promotion people say no again. And in that case, I have a solution that's a bit cynical. If you're not getting promoted for glue work, you stop doing glue work, just for a while. You temporarily do exactly the thing on the job ladder. It is going to kill you and your soul, but it's the right thing to do, even if it means letting more important things drop. Like, she should do some easily quantifiable technical work. Write a bunch of code, write some designs that anybody could have written. Learn how to performance tune the database. Do something that you know your organization will consider unarguably technical. And she should do it even if she's not the best person on the team to do it, even if she's rusty and she'll be slower than other people. But the thing is, that means she has to stop doing the other stuff. Coding can't fit in a calendar like this. So I would advise her, until the promotion's out of the way, to declare a whole lot of things, not her problem. Stop interviewing. Stop organizing the offsites. Stop onboarding. Stop replying to users. Stop anything that sounds like team building. Uh, Stop helping other people with their work. Archive mail, quit Slack channels. Do not curate the team roadmap. And crucially, don't catch things that are about to drop. This is the bit that is incredibly difficult, but the rest of the team is already doing that. Stop being the unofficial lead. And if you're in this situation and you're the official lead, stop that for a while too. Um, and I hate saying this, but um, if she does a lot of diversity work, I would recommend she stop doing diversity work for her company for a while. Getting promoted is diversity work. Being visibly successful is the most powerful diversity work she can do. She can be the representation that someone needs, but she needs free time in her calendar to do it. Only if you make a lot of things not your problem can you go from this to this. And like ideally better than this, but this is the best screenshot I could find in my calendar for the next two years. <laughs> um, um, these big empty spaces are good to block out for project work, for coding, for writing designs. And all of that work will have a side effect. It's a virtuous cycle. The side effect is that the person doing it will get better at coding and writing designs. The technical term for this is learning. Um, <laughs> the vast majority of our learning happens on the job. If the skills you wish you had are part of the job you're doing all day, then you get a certain amount of learning for free. Every time you hit Stack Overflow, you learn something. But for anything you're not repeatedly doing, you have to go out and choose to learn it. Even for people who are getting recognized for glue work and who want to keep doing it, I really recommend you keep increasing your other skills, because if you only do glue, you will only get better at glue. You are making your team more effective, but potentially hurting your future self. No matter what you end up doing, you're unlikely to regret feeling more confident in core technical skills. Learning is just something that our industry just doesn't talk about a ton. Um, 
all the technology that's in people's brains, they've learned in some way, but we act like it just appeared. I almost never see software engineers all like, I spent two hours trying to get my head around the difference between promises and callbacks, and I think I get it now. But we, we're all learning all the time. If you're a senior person, show the junior people on your team that you're learning and how you're doing it. Be public about learning. Some of us have the amazing privilege of having free time to learn, but others have obligations that mean they have literally zero free time. So make it clear that it's OK, it's normal to learn during work hours. Put it in your calendar. Because turning your mid-level people into senior people, it's a pretty great investment. Never waste an opportunity to have people learn things. Watch out for learning opportunities that you're wasting. Like if you're sheltering someone by always doing something for them, you're depriving them of an opportunity to learn. So if there's a thing you always do that you know how to do, you can find someone else who would benefit from learning how to do it and ask them, I mean, nicely, if they'd like to take it over. And then get them to block out some time in their calendar to learn about it and give them all of your support. We only get better at what we spend time on. And we do get better if we spend time on things. And not just technical things. My amazing colleague, Paulina, has advice on what she says when someone tries to push her into more humaning work than is good for her. They say, but you should do this because you're so good at communication. And she's like, yeah, I'm, I'm good at everything I put time into. You should see me doing systems design. <laughs> so while she's off designing systems, she's giving other people on the team a learning opportunity to become good at communication too by putting effort into it. If you're a manager, I encourage you to help the non-glue people on your team also put effort into communication. Remember those two guys in the story at the start? The awesome coder only succeeded because someone else on the team went and talked to other people and broke him out of the email chain of doom. He couldn't communicate well enough to ask another team for the data he needed. The system designer only succeeded because someone else on the team asked what the thing they were building was for. He didn't have the technical judgment to step back and understand how a system would integrate with other systems that the company was building and to be clear about the problem they were all solving. Should, should they have been promoted? Like, are they senior engineers? I don't think they are. And they won't learn to be if people keep doing their glue work for them. They'll get better at what they spend time on, and the vast majority of their learning will happen on the job. So uh, managers in the room, if your job ladder doesn't require that your senior people have this kind of skill, think about how you're expecting that work to get done. And glue people, push back on requests to do more than your fair share of non-promotable work. Put your effort into something you want to get good at. Our skills are not fixed in place. You can be good at lots of things, turns out. You can do anything. That's all I have. Thank you very much.